Saturday events uh, at Women in Media. Uh, I'm Katie Hannan and um, I'll be introducing our amazing panel here in a moment. Um, the topic we chose for the media uh, symposium this year is Does Journalism Have a Future? I actually nicked that title from um, a major piece that was uh, run in the New Yorker magazine a few months ago, which as a journalist, if you were reading it, um, uh, actually, as a citizen, if you were reading it, would frighten um, and scarify you because it is. it felt a little like uh, we've been talking about the future of journalism and you know whether print has a future in particular or traditional media has a future pretty much since the internet started to catch on um but it sort of feels like climate change now that we we sort of it was there for a long time but suddenly it's accelerating and certainly even within the last weeks and months um in in media around dublin um there is a real impending sense of doom uh, in terms of um, people's futures and how the industry is is going. I, I, I live right beside the Print Museum in Dublin at the moment and uh, I bring my kids there now and again. We were there the other day and there was old printers in from uh, the Irish press and they were showing some people there how the old hot type, linotype printing presses were used to work and there's a fabulous place if anyone ever wants to go. Um, and I was telling my kids mm. what it was like to work in the Endo when you would get the hurled off for the first edition. You'd go down and get your breakfast in the, in, um, the uh, Jerry's. Jerry's Scary Canteen, <laughs> 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 who had tea towel, we used to call the Shroud of Turin, for various <laughs> reasons. But anyway, you'd come back up, and as you were coming back up, you would feel the floor vibrating uh, beneath you, and that was the the presses would start to roll and honestly there wasn't a day that I didn't get a feeling in my stomach of the excitement of it's happening, it's going out, it's going out the world, we can't bring it back now and um, I, I, my kids were like, love the story and that and I was thinking they might have to actually explain to their children what it felt like to read a newspaper because it's quite possible that newspapers in the form that we, we are familiar with might not actually still be around for when they're there. So. Um, to talk about this and many other um, aspects of the future of journalism, I want to introduce our first uh, panellist, uh, Anya Kerr, who was just a normal, everyday political correspondent like myself not so long ago. But then <laughs> she moved on to bigger and better things. She joined up with an old colleague of mine, uh, Mark Little, who set up Storyful which was an extremely successful uh, media startup. Um, it ended up being bought by Rupert Murdoch for millions and millions, and Anya ended up being basically in charge of the whole thing. Um, she moved from there to Facebook, did really exciting work in Facebook, and is uh, now currently again joining up with Mark Little and is co-founder and chief operating officer of Kenzin, uh, which I'm sure she will explain uh, all about to us now. So ladies and gentlemen, Anya Khan. Into that question of does journalism have a future, and I would say yes, absolutely. But it comes with many. Can everyone hear on you? Because there, oh, there are, but if, if yeah, yep. go on. is that better? Apologies. So, yeah, to answer that question, does journalism have a future? I would say yes, absolutely, but with many caveats. Uh, we find ourselves in this massive moment of disruption that if the industry recognises and reacts to, there is absolutely the ability of journalism not only to survive, to absolutely thrive in this massive moment for democracy world over. And I guess that's what binds me every day when I go to work, is the belief that journalism is at the cornerstone of civic uh, communities, informed communities, and it is how we better understand the world around us. But in our industry, we've been through many revolutions, if you think about it. The, the mode of distributing journalism has fundamentally changed. It used to be the preserve of the editors. We would put out a newspaper, we would put out the six o'clock bulletin. Now news is distributed across websites, platforms, apps every day. So we've lost control there. The means of consuming news and information, there's been a Muslim revolution there. We now consume it on our iPads, our iPhones. We're constantly consuming news and information in different modes and by different means. And also what has fundamentally changed in terms of the disruption is that everybody is now a publisher. Every single one of you in this room can take out your smartphones in this moment, upload a video, 
piece of text, image, you are there, a storyteller here in Ballybunia, and you have a story to tell. So we've been through these massive moments of disruption and revolution, and I profoundly believe we've hit upon another one, and that is the moment where people and publishers, journalists, want to take back control. And I'll get to what I mean by that in a moment. But it's come about from this moment of we are as part of a misinformation disorder right now. We're dealing what could be termed in the industry of a wicked problem. And what is a wicked problem? Well, that's one where it's constantly changing, it's contradictory, it's complex, and there's no one solution to solve it. And a wicked problem in our moment is around misinformation, mistrust, manipulation, people feeling overwhelmed. What all of the research shows us is that people have had enough. They are fed up of the cookies that track us across the internet. I'm sure you've had those experiences of maybe a Ryanair flight that you were looking up two months ago and you're still seeing that advertising months later. You're going on websites and apps and you're doing this endless scroll and there is some research that shows that some of us do that. We're going to have arthritis in our thumbs in years to come that we climb the height of the Eiffel Tower in a given day. We scroll so much looking for meaningful content, but by looking for that, we're just consuming more advertising. We're getting more and more irritated. And that we're all on this kind of binge when it comes to content. We're going down our own filter bubbles. So all of our research in Kinzen has, has told us this past year and a half, people have had enough. They want to get back control of their productivity. They want to have a routine again with news. Like we, a lot of us grew up in a generation, and still do, where we put on Morning Ireland at 7 o'clock. We have our go-to newspapers. We have our uh, maybe 9 o'clock bulletin at night. But the generation coming behind us don't have a routine with it, and it feels incredibly unproductive. So what gives me hope is that the millennial generation, 18 to 34, 35-year-olds, are the ones saying, yes, I want news and information, but I want quality information. I want it all in one place. I want it bundled. I'm happy for algorithms to play a role if I can control them. And I will pay for news. And what gives me hope, and the reason I'm hopeful here today, is that there is a lot of research showing, in the US in particular, that 18 to 24-year-olds, there's been a bounce from 3% of that generation paying for news to 17% in a year. And that is because this is a generation that are sensitized to Netflix and Spotify and they're prepared to pay for quality and services that they control that give them quality in one place. And that's the moment for the industry now is to think about people. And that's where we lost our way along the way, I think, as an industry. We stopped doing people-powered journalism. Somewhere along the way, we stopped listening, we stopped doing transparency, and we started overloading people with advertising and overloading people with content. So there's a moment now for us as an industry, if we step back and think about what people want, this moment of misinformation, this moment of mistrust and manipulation, and step back and go, what does it look like to do people-powered journalism? What does it look like if we accept the advertising model is broken? What if we as an industry were to say, it's not about keeping people on our websites for as long as possible. What if we can believe in a concept called time well spent? It's about getting you in and giving you the right content in the right moment for the right amount of time. And I think if, if you think about that phrase, time well spent, you might have heard of the phrase fake news dominated 2016, 2017. This concept of time well spent is the next new phase, I believe, for, for our industry. And if we can tap into that, I think there's absolutely hope for journalism. But it's going to take a different approach. And I think for a lot of you, you probably have your local uh, Kerry newspaper, your local Kerry radio, your national titles that you feel binded to, you have an affiliation to them. You probably want to pay it forward. You probably want to contribute in some way to that journalism. We've done a terrible job of explaining the why journalism matters. Why should you pay that two euro for your daily newspaper? So we've got to go, go back to this people-powered journalism, make you feel a part of it. You become a member of a community. You subscribe to this community, whether it's the, the Sunday Times, the Times, the RTE, whatever it might be that you are part of that, because this is an entity that is listening and is part of your community. And I'll summarise by saying this. If we in journalism are going to have a sustainable future, we have to recognise that our newsrooms have not been very diverse. Um, and therefore, a lot of people in this country do not see themselves reflected in the news we produce every day that we have not been transparent at times explaining what are off the record sources, why did we choose this story. So we need to be far more transparent on top of being diverse. And we need to have an 
This is going to require new revenue streams, but we have got to get back to more local journalism, holding power accountable, representing communities, so people see it from the ground up. Okay, we will get back to a lot of those points in our uh, questions and answer session, but next up I want to introduce Ellen Coyne. Ellen is... Um, fantastically talented uh, young journalist. Um, she works for the Times Ireland edition, has worked for it since it was founded three years ago. Uh, and she does the kind of journalism that actually has an impact and, and really makes a difference. Uh, the, the three stories that she cites here in this bio, but I mean, we could, we could cite for many more. And that is very unusual for, for uh, you know, somebody who is really relatively new to, to um, media. Um, the, her work on uh, the Strategic Communications Unit. We don't have a Strategic Communications Unit anymore. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, <clears throat> she did uh, work on the maternity hospital, the ownership of the maternity hospital and, and the religious um, uh, ownership of that. That ended up uh, be making a major policy change. And, um, and of course, she's done a lot of work on um, rogue crisis pregnancy agencies and we are now getting regulation uh, to deal with that. So, you know, that's that's what, to me, journalism is all about. It's not about, you know, just entertaining people or whatever. It is really making social change and, and uh, real impact. Um, but she's also on this panel because she is uh, coming, you know, she's, she's a lot younger than me <laughs> and more of us. And I, I'm really interested to hear uh, how somebody at uh, Ellen's stage of her career is looking forward. So, Ellen, Ellen Coyne. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I feel really uh, under pressure to follow on you because she's so positive and vivacious and I'm worried I'm going to take the room like um, that scene in Father's Head where Tommy Tiernan starts listening to Radiohead and gets really maudlin and fat. Um, I mean, it's been a really difficult year in Irish journalism, as Katie kind of alluded to. Um, I mean, me and my partner uh, both work in print media, which is very exhilarating to have your entire household uh, based on a you know, basically dying industry. And you know, at a point last year where we would have felt very positive about the, where things were going, we're now having these very modern discussions where it's where we were like Welsh coal miners in like 1985 <laughs> or something, getting very, very terrified for the future. Um, and I definitely agree with a lot of the stuff Anya said there about, like, I, I think that one of the most important things of journalism was that it was never supposed to be our job to sell newspapers. We were just supposed to break the irons and then it was supposed to be someone else's job. And I'm increasingly finding myself doing like a show and tell where you break a story and then you have to really like emphasise to people how much it cost to do it, how long it took to do it and how crucial the subscription model was to doing it. But um, I actually kind of blame myself for doing something quite dangerous when I when I talk about things like that, because one of the things I'm most worried about is getting to a point in the future where we only fund exceptional journalism. Um, and you're getting kind of very um, strong feedback from the readers that they don't really want to do an all-in-one subscription anymore where they pay for the entire product of a newspaper. And sometimes it can be quite princessy stuff, like they'll be like, oh, they might really like the stuff that I write about gender equality or sexual politics. Those people aren't going to love paying for David Quinn's column on a Sunday as well. And they want to have like a pick and choose model where they can do that. Or something that we would get a lot is people really like the political uh, kind of slant of the Times Ireland, but you know, a fair criticism, they're really unhappy with the way that the London edition talks about certain issues like transgender issues and stuff. And it's very difficult to get the value of the product across. Um, earlier this year, we did a really, really long-term undercover investigation into this anti-abortion group based in the US, which is now planning to come here now that abortion is a legal health service. And they're just planning to target women outside hospitals and clinics and stuff, and really nasty, terrible stuff. But anyway, um, when the story broke, um, I was again doing my little like salesman thing of like trying to explain to people this investigation took like months and months. It was really expensive and it's really important. And I had this whole thread on Twitter and was like, we did this and we did that, and here's the video, here's the audio, here's their reaction, here's like the gap in the law. And then I said, um, this is journalism worth paying for. 
and had a little link to where you could subscribe to the Times. And I really regret saying that. I think looking back, that was actually a really stupid thing to say. Because if we keep going with this model, you can see um, all these uh, kind of schemes coming forward now where companies like Google will make huge amounts of money available to Irish news agencies to do investigative journalism. Or at the moment, I'm um, talking to a company called Whole Tales Podcast about trying to do a long-form uh, investigative journalism podcast, which people love and people are really happy to pay for. And if we don't succeed in getting the funding that we want, we know that we'll be able to crowdfund it like really, really quickly just because of the subject that it is and the fact that we have a following on social media that will do it. But if we keep going down that path, people will only fund those amazing, really sexy, glamorous investigations. And it totally negates the journalism that is worth paying for, which is the entire product. And I shouldn't be going around saying, this really cool investigation is journalism worth paying for, because it undermines everything else in the paper. And important journalism isn't like these award-winning scoops and these amazing investigations that get you loads of plaudits and are really like standout moments on your CV. It's like when you're at a press conference and Leo Radker says that they're not going to go ahead with a carbon tax anymore. Like that's, um, that's a policy decision that actually galvanises people. It can change the way people vote and it's very, very important. But if I'm like, guys, would you like to crowdfund me to um, cover leaders' questions every week? Absolutely nobody's going to pay for that. Like there's no money in that at all. So I think that before we go too far down that road of being like, yes, people will pay for the things that they want to, I don't think that we should, no disrespect to the readers, be giving them that much power anymore. The value of a newspaper is that there are people whose professional job it is to lay out stories in order of importance and make sure that you read the entire product, not just the stuff that reflects your worldview, not just the stuff that, like, because you're pro-choice, you like reading investigations that I do about shitty things anti-abortion groups are doing, um, and not just the columnists that you agree with. And also, the nature notes and the crossword, which are like the best thing in our paper every day, invariably. Um, I think that we need to move back to a point where people actually understand the value of news and actually the value of being a journalist. Like we're not just there to do the amazing undercover scoops. We're also there because we know what's important and we know what the right questions are to ask. And a lot of the times our job is really boring, but that is journalism worth paying for and not just the cool, glamorous stuff. Mm. I do see an interesting dialogue opening up between Anya and Ellen in terms of the model we should be focusing on. We will do that uh, later. We'll come back to that because next I want to introduce uh, Lise Hand. Uh, again, I like everyone on this panel. doesn't really need an introduction for me. She's worked for the Sunday Independent, the Irish Independent, the Tribune, the Sunday Times, and currently a political writer with the Times Ireland edition as well. Um, Lise has done... And also has worked in movies, has uh, uh, done waitress, waitress <laughs> apparently can hold six plates in one arm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, and, and has done everything from uh, you know s social features uh, to uh, fantastic uh, political writing and fantastic sketch writing. Um, but she's seen it all, folks, and now she's going to tell us about it. <laughs> Well, I suppose uh, Ellen, you know, being the young person on the panel, I'm the token L one. So and I was very amused listening to um, to Katie when she was talking earlier on about the, you know, being in the in the Indo and the, the the press, you know, sort of setting up at night and the rumble of the building because I remember that. And I I think when you you know, I'm not completely ancient, but the, my first day in a newsroom, uh, I was put sitting in front uh, or behind a typewriter, like one of the old Underwood ones that went like that. And you would write uh, on, you know, you'd have carbon paper, you know, between the two sheets and um, you're always told to keep it black. And I had to explain to a young journalist once that I wasn't a slave owner, right? This is like a black, was actually carbon paper. Then you would shout copy and a, co a copy boy would run over, take the copy, bring it over where the it would be edited, rolled up, put in a vacuum tube. A thing would go and it would go all the way down to the case room where it would then be put on top metal. Now that's, that was how I started off. And now, of course, I'm, you know, filing stories on my phone. And I think the thing about journalists, um, they're incredibly adaptable. And we always have been because we've had to. We've had to go with the flow. We've had to deal with the changing technology. We've, we've you know, we, we just 
evolve constantly because our profession is always is always changing and news is always changing. So you know, it's not a job anyone ever goes into a for the money and b for the, so the, you know for a nine to five because you're never off. And I, I think when I look back at so, uh, that newsroom, the, the newsrooms used to be zoos. I mean, literal zoos. There'd be profanity, there'd be roaring, screaming, shouting, phones going off, clacking typewriters. And now when you go into a newsroom, it's like going into, it could be anything. It could be a, a, telecom, a telesales office, it could be anything. It's, they're empty because there's been a cull of so many journalists, and particularly the older, more expensive journalists have been, a lot of the time, they've been shoved out the door because they're expensive and they're old. And they tend to be cranky in the awkward squad and ask questions and, you know, just be difficult. And you'll see banks of what they call content providers now, which are, you know, people, with, uh, say, young people who are brought in to take things down from the internet and repackage them, reimagine them, or whatever they want to call them, uh, for online content. And that is... I think the nub of the problem with journalism. I mean, there's two different problems. You have the the fact that advertising, you know, it has gone through the floor, and journal, you know, and newspapers aren't funded anymore. But there's a fundamental problem that when technology suddenly exploded, a lot of newspapers galloped towards the technology and left the people behind, as in the journalists. And when they started emptying newsrooms, this had a massively profound effect because. In the olden days, you would send reporters, when the newsroom was, was empty, it was because reporters were at council meetings, they were in the Dáil, they were at residence associations, there was a scrap in a, you know, in, a, you know, in a pub down the road, they were down with a notebook talking to those. And because of the very visible presence in the community, they were trusted. People would say, oh, there's so-and-so, you know, there's Ellen, uh, you know, there's, there's Derville. So we tell them this because we know that they'll give us a fair shake. And they got to know their local journalists. And this, the journals were embedded in the communities. And when the cull started and newsrooms started emptying, this had a profound effect on people's relationship with journalists. Uh, I think there were figures released by the US Labour, uh, Department of Labour, I think they began at the end of last year. And it showed that I think something like 53,000 journalists had lost their jobs over a decade. And at the same time, and one in four in local regional papers, and at the same time, the staff of the New York Times had doubled, the staff, I think, of the LA Times had gone up by a quarter, and journalism became centralised. And then, you know, flash forward to November uh, 2016, and there were people crying all over the streets of New York because Donald Trump had just won, and everybody was going, how did that happen? I won them, by the way. And how did that happen? And it happened because... When the campaign has been covered, journalists were been sent from LA, they were been sent from New York, they were been sent from DC, and they were, you know, they, they would land in, get a few sound bites, and head off again. And because journalists, and they had no also local intelligence networks to tap into, to say, look, what's what, you know, what does so and so think, and what's happening? Because I remember, I I recall the day of the election, ringing my newsroom, and saying to Richie, the editor, this is going to be close, you know, this is going to be closer than people think, because. I had spent a few weeks going around and going to places like Charlotte and up and down Ohio and just talking to punters and I was kind of shocked, at, I kept on hearing, oh I'm going to vote for Donald Trump for X number of reasons and it was the moment when I was standing in uh, Charlottesville I think it was and this, talking to this lovely young 20 something year old who was beautifully dressed and I said, where do you live? And she went, North Pole. And I went, <laughs> yeah, you, know, to, you know, she said, no, 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 I live in North Pole, Alaska. And I've flown down, because I know this is a red, it's, this is a, you know, red, blue possibility swing state. And I want to actually canvas, so, for Donald Trump. So, it's, by only, I wouldn't have got that if I had been sitting in an office, you know, looking at the thing online, because I wasn't physically talking to people. And if we want to restore the broken model of journalism, it's more than just technology. It is restocking newsrooms and training them properly. Training them how to, how to get a story, how to source a story, and saying, what are you doing sitting there? Get out. Talk to people. Get out from behind the screen. So it's, there's, there's, you know, there's two parts to the story. It's trying to find the technological model that, that Anya described so brilliantly, you know, to so people can consume news in a different way. But it doesn't matter what technology is used. At the end of the day, you've still got to have live bodies to go out there and communicate and talk to people. And that is actually, I think, is key. 
So I would love to see newsrooms back. I would love to see them zoos again. I'd love to hear the profanity and the, you know, everybody fighting for stories and, and having, I mean, even something like calling journalists content providers. It's almost like reporter and journalism is a dirty word. So we've got to also instill pride and say this, it's, it's a tough job, but my God, it's a great job. And, you know, I'll just finish on this. When I was writing a piece after the death of, of Lyra last week, I didn't know her. But her face is familiar, and I'm fairly sure our paths had crossed. So when I started looking at some of, you know, at some of the things she'd written and at her TED talk, the one thing that struck me was she was so old school. Because she understood that how you bring around change and how you get people to trust you is through conversations. And that's what journalists do. They are the conduit between an issue and, the, and you know, it's the, they are the ones that's, that, that just act as a bridge between the information and, and the newspaper. And, you know, Lyra was old school. And I think we need more, of, more, more Lyras, you know, and less content providers. And if we do that, I think there is a future. I don't know, does that make me feel young or old? <laughs> a bit of both, I think. Um, Darvel, I should say, of course, actually, as advertised um, on our panel, um, Keelan Shanley was supposed to join us this morning. Unfortunately, she, she became ill yesterday and couldn't make it down, so she sends her apologies. Um, but Darvel MacDonald very, very kindly uh, uh, agreed to step in at the last minute. Um, again, who, do I need to introduce Darvel? Uh, <laughs> no, obviously, Darvel, you know, you know, journalist, legal uh, correspondent, business editor, um, most recently documentary maker, um, and um, just all around amazing person who can stand in at the very last minute and will now have something amazing to say about the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, as will be reflected in my thoughts, uh, standing in very, very last minute. Really interesting time for me personally, two years ago. I was here uh, receiving um, that, which I think is one of the greatest honours that any Irish uh, female journalist can receive, which is the Mary Cummins Award. And I come back here today and, and uh, I sort of quit for a while after 15 years at the cold face of Irish journalism, so very much contemplating my own future and uh, the future of media generally. That sort of existential crisis that uh, Ellen was talking about, I experienced seven years ago when I represented Ireland as an Eisenhower Fellow and travelled all over the US um, looking at the future of the media in the digital age. It was a crazy, crazy programme, 100 meeting in 13 states in eight weeks, trying to look at it from every single um, area. And it was a very, very interesting time to go because that's when America, American journalism was having an absolute existential crisis. The scale of job losses had been unbelievable. I remember um, going to, uh, my first stop was Philadelphia, where the Philadelphia Inquirer, which had won a Pulitzer for every year since the programme had started, once valued at four billion, had that week been sold for fifty million to um, a group of investors, um, including property developers. Sound familiar? You know, it was kind of a, it was a very, very interesting time. And one of the people I met on that actually it was a Kerry connection because his his family were from Kerry, but he was a journalism professor at Medill School in Chicago. And I went to meet him, and he couldn't meet me that day because he'd won a Pulitzer. And I remember meeting him the next day, his mother had sent him back to Chicago. She was like, there is an Irish girl, you are not, not going to meet her. And I was like, oh my God. And he won a brilliant Pulitzer on something that was really, really important, looking at violence um, in schools. And I was like, no disrespect, but why are you a professor, you know, at a university? And it was because he couldn't stay in the game. And I remember that was a really, really profound moment um, for me. So that was, that was a really, really interesting trip for me because, and again, it was coming across those, you know, phrases that make you want to vomit like content creators and everything you know and just like, kind of seeing that way that people have changed but I came back from that trip um, knowing that something fundamental had changed and it's been referenced before journalism hit a perfect storm and it was advertising it was the means of production it was the means of distribution and we're actually still only very much in the early foothills of technology so it's going to continue to change and if you think of it um, and no disrespect to our predominantly male and um, newspaper editors but for about a hundred years they were told here's the model don't change it don't do a thing, get your classifieds in, get everything else in. And yes, the beauty of print was that you got lots of different opinions, but we have to confront the reality that that has changed. I went over to the States as a print journalist and came back as a multimedia one. And that was predominantly my mindset as much as anything um, else. So what really, really worries me about the future um, of journalism, and obviously we've dedicated this weekend to the memory of Lear McKee. Lear McKee wasn't a staff journalist in any newspaper. 
She wasn't in the Bell Tale, she wasn't in the Irish News. She had an enormous impact for such a young woman, but at 29 years of age, she didn't go through that traditional structure that we went through. I remember my first editor, Fiona McHugh at the Sunday Times, I remember she didn't want us in the newsroom on Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, because if you're in the newsroom, you weren't out getting stories. You know, we were sent, to, it, it was just a totally different thing. What worries me, having risen through the ranks to probably one of the most senior roles um, in Irish media as group business editor um, of independent news media for the last couple of years, but haven't been with the company for much longer, was actually seeing not just the attrition of our, um, what we call that kind of, and we saw it across the public service, it wasn't just in journalism, but that kind of institutional memory and knowledge the journalist who you could go to in the newsroom and when you thought you were reinventing the wheel but actually it had happened before but we got rid of a lot of the institutional memory across our media and then we had this extraordinary young talent coming in but because of living conditions the cost of living particularly in dublin property and everything that couldn't stay in it how many liras did we lose you know in the course of that so i was very very mixed um about the future of journalism and look at me now i've sort of stepped aside for a little bit of San Lee's, we call it a bit of a gap year. But I'll tell you what, I'm the reason why I think we're going to be okay. And you'll see it on this panel and you'll see it all across the weekend. There is no better job than journalism. The profound privilege of bearing witness to the times that you live in, to writing the first draft of history, messy and ugly and grotesque as sometimes that can be, going in every day with a blank page, it might be a blank web page or whatever, but bearing witness to the times that you live in. And, you know, I look back to the, the moments of history that we have all witnessed, living in New York during 9-11, and that's what really made me want to be a young journalist. Growing up in Northern Ireland is what really, really prompted me to go into journalism, that you could be a voice for others. It broke my heart, and I wept, as I'm sure many people did, waking up to the news of young Lyra, because there was another generation, you know, and, that, and she died bearing witness to something that we thought she would never might uh, have to see. But really, really starting out, you know, on all of those kind of big moments, you know, whether it was being in Dublin Castle for the marriage equality vote or anything like that. And as long as, well, it might not be print in our veins. And I remember, you know, when colleagues would leave, and you will remember this, and, and Katie, you will, but the lockdown, yeah. when a colleague leaves and they lift a ruler, and it is the most emotional thing when you hear the bang of a ruler. And I remember the la one of the last lockdowns I watched uh, in the Indo, the younger journalists were like, just what's the noise? What is that? You know, and we were like weeping with you know, this huge big memory. But what makes me positive about the future of the media is that we'll find a way. And yes, with fake news and everything, I think it w the pendulum is swinging back because trust has become more important than ever before. What we have to do, and I would agree with the girls, is that what we have to do is ensure that we don't go to an elitism, that there's going to be a two or three tier in terms of, uh, like, there's going to be uh, an information, you know, that, that is going to be very, very important. But actually, believe it or not, trust has become more important. And as long as there are people like us, there were many things we could have done. This is a crazy game. It's madness. It's crazy, but to go out and do that, and that's what makes me really sure because as long as there is story there are going to be people who want to tell it my only worry is that what we're losing critically especially in rural ireland is that if you're not covering the uh, the planning decisions if you're not covering the county council decisions we're at real real risk and that's actually where that sort of a vaccine <coughs> comes in so i hope there is going to be a resurgence and uh, i hope so because i've just quit my job <laughs> <laughs> And I just remind you again, she didn't know she was doing this like, 24 hours ago. Um, our final uh, panellist, uh, I am uh, delighted that Susan uh, could join us. Susan Mitchell, anybody who has even a passing interest in the health service in this country will know Susan's work. Uh, she is the go-to person uh, if a health story breaks, because most of the time she has broken it. Um, she is currently the deputy editor of the Sunday Business Post um, and has won... I don't know how many awards for her uh, incredible work on the cutting edge of, as I say, anything to do with the health industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and you know social issues around that. Um, so let's hear what she thinks uh, about the future of journalism. Thanks, Katie, for your very generous uh, introduction. Um, so I might start actually by just expanding or, or, or adding to what Lee said, which I thought was a very important point about the importance of local journalism. And Katie referenced a piece that was in the New Yorker on which this session today is actually based. Uh, Does journalism have a future? And I read that piece as well. It was very much around the importance of local news and the fact that newsrooms in local newspapers have been so decimated 
that they missed Trump, the emergence of Trump um, in, in the States. Um, in Britain, the, the media missed uh, Brexit, uh, missed the fact that this was actually going to get over the line until very, very close to the end. And I think that there is a real need to have people on the ground and out of newsrooms. Um, I even see it in our own place. Many of us are far too desk bound, um, as opposed to being out. When I, when I first started in, in journalism, it was about 20 years ago, you know, you were never, never in the, the newsroom, you were never at your desk, you were always out meeting people. And I think, you know, that we've in some ways also become quite reactive as a profession. So uh, I found, I, I obviously covered the cervical check uh, scandal or the cervical check debacle uh, that emerged this time last year. And for me, it was a real low point in terms of the Irish media and how we actually dealt with that, which was a, an awful, um, an awful event because we actually didn't explain what was happening to people, um, at least we didn't explain it correctly. There was very, very little context given to readers. I still meet people, friends of mine, women, you know, even at Christmas it happened, and I met someone who said, oh, but weren't diagnoses withheld from women? And I thought, gosh, that really is such a bad indictment of us as a collective in the media. And I think that, that partly stems from this kind of 24-hour news cycle that we feel we have to be first with everything, that we feel we have to be first out there and where a politician, no matter how ignorant, or, or anyone, I don't mean to, 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 to um, you know, name and shame politicians, but anyone who is willing to say anything sensationalist will get airtime or uh, some coverage in, in a newspaper. And that's, I think, a real problem and it's interesting to see the newspapers, the traditional newspapers that are doing well uh, overseas. Uh, somebody mentioned the New York Times earlier. Um, you know, the New York Times is over four million subscribers. Um, it's never had more journalists, as I think uh, I can't remember whether it was Derwin or, or Lee said that earlier. The Guardian um, is doing really well, even though it has a very unique uh, model because obviously it doesn't rely on subscribers. Um, it relies on donations and this kind of idea of a membership or a type of community who, who buys in and who are invested in what, what they do. And they do a lot of campaigning journalism, which I think is great, particularly around the environment. And actually it's something that the Times Ireland has done, I think, very well uh, here, here at home. Um, but I was listening to an interview that Catherine um, Viner, the editor of The Guardian, did just about, you know, what will, you know, like I, I definitely think there's going to be a future for journalism, by the way, because people want facts, people want information, um, and I think they want context. And she said it's it will be about providing or, or offering journalism that gives all of those things and that differentiates itself from not necessarily always being the first to get, you know, like a, a, a second tier story that you know a politician's going to release anyway later that day. You know that that you're going after and you're trying to give readers added value um, and I think you know that's something just uh, that the correspondent I don't know how many of you are familiar with with that um, you know this is a new project effectively <coughs> that was initiated um, originally in Holland uh, they now have 60,000 subscribers and it's all about explanatory journalism um, very little about news uh, news making in fact they actually use the tagline news breaking or sorry news like it's uh, I can't remember uh, uh, Unbreaking, uh, unbreaking news. news, that's it, thanks, Sonia. <laughs> um, so it's, it's completely different, they have a completely different mindset. And there is an interest, I, like I, I took great comfort from how well it has done when it went to actually get, um, it's now, it's now uh, they're launching an English site, and they managed to bring in 2.4 million euro in funding in the course of 30 days, which to me shows that there is a huge appetite out there for what people believe and hope will be a quality product. So I think there definitely is a future for journalism. Um, you know, we're here to hold people to account all of those noble and, and lofty, lofty things. But I think we probably need to do what we're doing better. Um, and I don't think it's just about the technology or about, you know, advertising is, is falling off a cliff. There's no classifieds anymore. They are real problems. And technology is an issue, but I think we also need to provide people with better journalism. So that's my...
going to uh, throw this open to the floor very soon, but I just wanted to pick up on a couple of uh, points that, that uh, came up in, in, in that round table there. Mm -hmm. And in particular, it struck me that from uh, what, of, what Anya's project is, which is, and the rest of us, I suppose, are still kind of in the traditional world of old media, but Anya's project is, is uh, you know, a stab at creating something new again. But it... Uh, Tell me that I, if I'm wrong in this, but the sense is that a lot of us in all media are worried about local journalism and, as, as Alan said, the boring bits. But it's the, the shoe leather journalism, the, 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 the planning meetings, the council meetings, the things that actually have huge impact on, you know, the local, very, lo, you know, local community. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that you kind of put on a list that this is the thing I'm really going to pay for. So I'm wondering how Kenzen isn't going to, you know, just create more echo chambers. Is that not a danger? That if people are only going to do the stuff that they like, or that, they, that appeals to them initially, that they're never going to be challenged, and they're certainly never going to pay for the wider sphere of media. Yeah, it's such a great question. So just to give a little bit of context on Kinzen, uh, so we're a technology company that wants to connect people with quality journalists. Very, very simple. And to give you a routine around that. So we are building personal news products, um, the first of which is in the Apple Store. You can go in and download the Kinzen app. And if you go in there, you can create channels based on your topics, your profession, your location, your interests. And you can basically set a routine around each because who we are in the mornings is very different to who we are in the evenings. In the morning, I care about the weather, the commute. Maybe I've got a big meeting coming up today and I want to research that very specifically. Come the evening, I start to care about Netflix, Monaghan football, the great heartache of my life. So I go into Kinzen every day. Who I am in the morning is very different to my evening. And I set a routine around that. If I'm cycling in the morning, I set up a channel, I convert that to audio so I can listen to it while cycling. And it's personalised to me. But to Katie's point, the critical piece of this is that while I want something that's quality and personalised and localised, that is me and relevant to me, we also have hundreds of people who have come in uh, this past six months to be curators. And we have a community of people who are building playlists of news every day, from breastfeeding to cryptocurrency. So I can go in all the time and say, yeah, that's an expert on cryptocurrency. I'm going to follow that channel today and build it in. So that on the one hand, yes, it's personalised to me. And on the other hand, I'm broadening my mind. Because if all we ever did in Kinzen for publishers and for people was push you down only into your own bubble, you wouldn't be challenged. You wouldn't be more informed about the world around you. So that's been critical, and especially coming for from Facebook for me and from Mark coming from Twitter, is to learn the unintended consequences of the platforms. And one of the unintended consequences of the platforms for local was that it became the preserve of the big titles. If you were a big New York Times, Washington Post, you do well on Facebook because of the virality, it's, it's the mass audiences. And along the way, local really suffered because of the platforms being really algorithms around virality. With our system, what we're saying in Kinzen is, you own the algorithm. We never want you to come into Kinzen and have an experience through one of the publishers of our technology or through our app and wonder, why am I seeing that? You can decide to exclude something, uh, decide I only want to see these topics, show me more of these sources. You are in control of your algorithm. So when you come into Kinzen, you can see local <laughs> independent bloggers, local journalists, local newsrooms, right up to your well-known international but, titles. Again, what, how, how does that not become an echo chamber? I mean, how, how does that not become just the very limited worldview that you have exaggerated and, uh, you know, put up in lights, basically, without any interference from a critical or a challenging Yeah, thing. Well, because the, the key thing that is different is that community. When you come into the, the first page of Kinzen on a publisher website or in our app, is that community. You can see a shelf of all of the things the community are doing. Hundreds of people have come to us the last six months to build those channels for other people because they have said, number one, news is broken, I want to help fix it. And that's why like, that, that idea of curation might feel new to all of us, but we probably do it every day in terms of our topics and interests. So there's people now doing it for each other as part of a let's from the ground up build something that is going to challenge people about the world around you. So if you do come in, we're thinking about Kinzen as health and fitness for news. So if you think about your phone right now, you probably have an app on it for, to help your sleep, your meditation, your carbohydrates versus your protein. Well, why not a health and fitness app but for news? 
but that has a community within that that is trying to give you a healthier news diet and that you set goals around it. So what about coming into a news experience every week and saying it's not more and more giving me more content. It's not about the time I'm going to spend. Instead, it's back to this time well spent. This week, I want to be more informed about climate change. I want to be challenged about some of the political perspectives I might have and that you actually set goals and track it over a period of time. Okay, I do wonder <laughs> how, how much kale eating type thinking we do around our news consumption uh, was a really interesting um, um, concept. Um, so best of luck with that. Right. Going I wanted to ask, I, the, the, I do get a sense often these weekends, it's our seventh um, conference, that it can get a little bit self-congratulatory and we're all, you know, we're all mad about each other and we're all very supportive. But of course we do realise that, especially if you're on social media at all, that a lot of people are very angry with journalists mm -hmm. now. There, there, there is a real sense that journalists have let people down and that we didn't catch, uh, you know, in terms of the international stories in the States as, as soon as so we you know, this huge, huge social upheaval was missed and uh, the effects of austerity and, and the political consequences was missed. And a lot of that is because of the fact that we are, as we say, stuck in newsrooms now and there isn't enough of us to, to, to go out there and that that relationship is gone. But I just thought maybe, Ellen, that sense of how do we work backwards from where we have ended up, you know, as one of the most, probably right down there with politicians in terms of, um, you know, professions that people have issues with. Yeah, I mean, um, we do talk a lot about how much we love this job and Dervil articulated so well, like what a privilege it is. But it, all, it can be kind of terrible sometimes. And like, we're not nuns, like we're not doing a vocation. This is a job. And if it becomes that unpleasant, you just get the sense that everybody hates you all the time as well as sometimes not wanting to talk to you. It's really difficult to expect people to remain in that job for a long time. And if the government come to you and offer you a much more secure job as a press advisor, I don't think anybody can be sneering or snarking about journalists that choose that role. And I think that the one thing that I've noticed very rapidly in Ireland over the last couple of years is before, if I wrote a story that somebody didn't like, it would be because I am a Murdoch shill or part of the establishment, like blah, 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 tale as old as time. That was fine. That's <laughs> nothing new. But what people have actually started doing now is countering it with their own version of the news. So rather than just leaving the story as something that they disagree with, uh, very small groups uh, like anti-vaxxers, kind of the Irish far right, now setting up their own news sources that uh, basically are devoted to saying that the stuff that I write is coming from a particular agenda, that it isn't true, spreading misinformation. And a little information is always a dangerous thing. I think that the Irish public probably think that they have amazing media literacy at the moment, that they can see through all of our agendas. But the fact of the matter is, when I look at the responses we get from readers, I think that media literacy, particularly among millennials, is absolutely terrible. Like the amount of times people tell you that the mainstream media isn't covering something, linking to an article from the Irish Independent, which is where they learnt it from. Um, I mean, it's totally and utterly dispiriting. Um, and Anya's project sounds brilliant. And when you're talking about the problem that I have with trying to get people to value news, I think that it's that's not something that can be fixed by the way that we deliver it or our funding model. I think that we need to go way back to a point in time where people actually appreciate that being a journalist is a proper trade. Like we are in this job, not just for the crack or like getting to fun panels like this. It's because we do know the importance of stories and how to find things out. And people have stopped appreciating the worth of news, particularly local news that we keep talking about. The fact that there actually is a value on that, that people are providing you with a service. Um, and I think that we're kind of realising it a little bit too late because we were in such a rush to get on top of um, the internet and the new way that stories are being delivered that along the way we actually forgot to emphasise to people you actually do have to put a value on this. And it's like post offices and libraries, uh, use it or lose it. And I just hope that it's not too late now to kind of go back and just really emphasise to people that you have to put a value on what we're doing. Yeah, and I just before I just one last question, I'm going to ask you about this, Susan, because your former editor Ian Kyo and uh, Tom Lyons, another former colleague of yours, have just I saw they were just went on job hashtag job fair yesterday looking for staff for a new venture. You might just t tell us a little bit about it, and it's really interesting that they have obviously done research and, and decided that there is this can be monetized. Yeah, exactly. So um, Ian and Tom both were Ian was my former editor, and Tom had my job. He was deputy editor. And our newspaper was bought over recently, and I think they just made a decision, we don't want to work for people anymore. We actually want to run our own you know, media outfit, 
and be the people, like make the decisions. And I think they had lots of feelings about the kind of commercial aspect of the business post, which is which is where I work, and felt that a lot of things would need to change, etc. Um, so they decided to go, to go it alone. They've set up, which is a great name, it's called The Currency. Um, and they're going to be focused very much on business, economics, and public policy. They've, um, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to say so, but they, you know, they've got backing. Um, I don't want to say too much because I'm not sure how much they've disclosed themselves. So, yeah, uh, you weren't supposed to say that, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Can they, everyone just forget she said that? <laughs> They have look. They have got. It, it, it's. I won't say how much, but they've got. You know, they've got backing, um, which shows that there are investors willing to invest in a product. But I think probably from their perspective, or from from people who might choose to go to work with them, you know, they're both really talented journalists. Um, they, you know, they break stories. They're great at analysis. They have brilliant contacts, um, and they have also said that they want to do um, more investigative type work. Uh, so I, I, I get the impression they're not going to be in the, the breaking news uh, type space um, and clearly they feel that there is a gap a gap for that and um, you know I hope, hope they're right. That, that's probably been one of the biggest changes I think in journalism over the last maybe 20 years. There has always been and for very very good reasons a very very separate line between commercial and editorial and as you said earlier the journalist stood up and did the work and the salespeople went out and got the money in and did that and there were very very good and sound reasons for that i think one of my biggest reflections from the eisenhower fellowships was that journalists could no longer rely on someone else to do the money job for them that actually we have to be very innovative and think about how we do it and that's why so many journalists whether it is on you, whether it's the boys have actually said, actually, no, we want to take control. We know what our specialism is. We know what our strength is. We know what our readers want. So they've actually become entrepreneurs and innovators um, in their own right. And I think it's been very, very interesting seeing some of the innovations that have happened um, in Ireland, even in recent weeks, whether it's Tom and Ian or the journal starting off with Noteworthy. There have been, you know, some interesting sort of iterations that are happening. But that's probably the biggest thing that in the past it was somebody else's job to get the money in. But we now have to think about how we, and, and it's, on, it's probably something you, you've seen. Yeah, and I, I, back to the future sustainability of journalism, we need to, in journalism schools, teach entrepreneurial journalism. We have always been obsessed with the supply of our journalism, writing stories, getting them out there, and that's great. But we haven't thought enough about the demand for it. Like, how do we create, create a demand and appetite for journalism? How do we tra be transparent about it? How do we bake in news literacy as a part of it, that you actually teach people critical thinking skills, like a journalist, who, what, where, when, how, why, so that they will actually recognise that is a piece of quality journalism that I'm going to share with my friends and family over the piece of misinformation that's there to spew confusion and misinformation amongst the network. So, yeah, I'm a big believer in teaching entrepreneurial journalism that journalists do need to connect the demand and the supply of their journalism ultimately to create appetite and need for the content that they produce. But surely the, the, difficulty yeah, not, um, surely the difficulty is not appetite. We all know there's a massive appetite for, for journalism of all kinds, good, bad uh, and ugly. Uh, but the difficulty is getting people to put their hands in their pockets and pay for it, surely. Yeah, I mean, I think, there, um, is this working? Um, I think there was, I think Ellen actually used a very important word when she used the word trade, because journalism isn't a profession, it's a trade. It's like, you're like a brickie or a carpenter, you know, it's, you learn how to put a story together, to build it, to craft it, to put it brick by brick. And some of that is, you know, done through... DIT or through DCU, you know, when you do a journalism course. But again, looping back to what I was saying earlier, a lot of, you go into a newsroom as an apprentice and then you're assigned to somebody who shows you that if you build a brick wall that way, it's gonna blow over, you know, the first storm that comes along. So again, you are mentored through journalism as well and by people who have a hinterland of knowledge. So when, you know, a story breaks and you're running around going, oh my God, oh my God, they're going, well, look, that happened six, seven years ago and they can put it in a context because they have the, 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 the knowledge. And I think the, a part of that as well is then, you know, it's a confidence building thing because, you know, when you've been as a young apprentice and you feel you can build a wall, then you can go out and you can create the structure around it. And you become, a lot of journalists are good self-starters. You know, you, you don't always sit there and wait for someone to give you something to do. So it's a profession that is... Oh, incredibly adaptable. You have a lot of skill. I think a lot, a lot of journalists also underrate their skill set as well. You know, I mean, you go in in the morning and sometimes you're given a story and you really, you know, you're not on top of the topic. But by the end of the day, you're an expert. You know, because you've had to make calls, you find out people, you research, you think about it, and you write it. And 
it's you know it's 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 a un, it's an undervalued skill. So I think you know journalists have to be you know told that the, you know that they're all right. They're good. You know they are good people. It's a good it's a good profession, and I think um, that's you know again it, that goes back to restructuring the newsroom and how how newsrooms are are, are built, and. Um, it's, you know, when you look around at the, at the, you know, like no one told Susan to, you know, we need to investigate this. She went off and, and looked at it herself. And, you know, it's, it's a, uh, and you get feedback from people as well. You know, somebody ring you up and say, you know, listen, I have this thing. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to talk to you about it. In the old days, you'd have the citizen at the desk. Do you remember? We've all had that. But the news, you know, the news editor would say, there's a citizen downstairs who's got, you know, a bag of documents all in green biro, usually a will. And you'd have to go down and you know, talk face to face. That's gone now because everything is done virtually. So again, I think it just keeps going back to the, you know, the, the physical, the training of the journalist, the, you know, the self-work about it. And just to sort of, you know, just to get out there and, and, you know, and learn through your mistakes as well. It's like, it's about, you know, it's about screwing up stories. We've all done that. Yes, My nice. God, we've all done that. Yeah, I was just going to make actually, Katie, on what you said about monetizing, you know, how to monetize it. And of course, there's huge challenges and many uh, media outlets, including our own initially, or newspapers anyway, started off by providing content online for free, which really was such a bad mistake because I think it cheapened everything that we do. And now there's a, you know, not everybody has that, but many people, many members of the public, just to expect expect to get their news for free. I'm amazed, even on social media, we're behind a paywall, arguably a, too hard a paywall, but that, that's another story. But, you know, people will take photographs of your work and put it up online, and you think, you know, we have to pay salaries here. We have, you know, a team of 20 or 30 journalists and, and many others in accounts and advertising who need, who, who need to pay bills. Um, but it devalued, I think, journalism by doing that. But I think, you know, just there are plenty of examples out there at the moment, thankfully, of newspapers that are turning a corner in terms of their subscription model. I think, you know, expecting to uh, rely on ad revenue with the likes of Google and Facebook is just will not be an option for us. Or at least I, I don't see a way forward uh, with that. It will be uh, via subscriptions. Um, but it's just a much more competitive market because, you know, thanks to technology, you know, we can avail, of, I, I, I have the New York Times on my phone. I would never, unless I went into Eason's 10 years ago, I couldn't have got the New York Times or tw tw 20 years ago. So we're all competing against some of the best newspapers in the world for your attention, um, which makes it much more difficult, but not impossible. Can I just say two quick things on that? But one, I think we're going to see, for a lot of people, the price of free is actually too expensive because they're sick and tired of being worried about is there a data in breach and we've seen all the controversies this past year why are they being forced uh, forcefully fed these advertisements and recommendations so I think we're going to see for people free is actually too expensive but one worry I have absolutely this industry has to diversify how it makes money whether it's that remaining free and it's a traffic advertising play right up to subscriptions memberships donations maybe in between my worry and one we have to be conscious of is that more and more quality journalism is going to disappear behind paywalls which is right and proper but who does that leave behind there are unfortunately lower socioeconomic backgrounds people who can't afford to pay for quality and when that disappears yeah, the vacuum, that's where extremism, that's where misinformation thrives, and that's where you see filter bubbles, biases then actually start to become more complicated. I wonder, should, I mean, I know this has been, this has been uh, debated by the National Newspapers of Ireland, um, but the idea that we should, we, we are getting to a point where if we want to have any kind of quality media, that the idea of the, the TV licence fee, that there should be some sort of subsidised, uh, government subsidy for... for I think you're going to see that with a whole debate playing out now around regulation, VAT subsidies, uh, tax incentives for publishers, that this has actually started to be sustainable from ground yeah, up. Because I, I, I actually don't think that there is a general appreciation of just how difficult things are commercially for particularly the print media now, and, I, and uh, uh, RTE and uh, radio stations. I think uh, there isn't really appreciation that post-Brexit in particular you know, the commercial market uh, is, uh, has taken a massive hit. I'm going to open it up to the floor now because I'm sure... Yes, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry, I always ask a question. Um, I want to pick up on something Anya said about lack of diversity in newsrooms. 
Uh, oh, hi. Um, so I have two questions. One is say to Ellen, you know, and we know those stories that you have doggedly worked away on. Um, but if newsrooms are lacking in political diversity, can you say to yourself that you're willing to be open-minded and pursue stories that perhaps don't necessarily fit your world agenda, your world view, if you know what I mean? And the second one is to Susan. I'm sorry we haven't had an opportunity to meet personally before. I think your journalism is outstanding. And if you take the cervical check story as an example, and your point, I thought collectively it was disgraceful how that was discovered, and you and David Robert Grimes were almost the only people actually explaining what was really, really going on. And my point being that there's a lot of bad journalism. And I don't want to pay some kind of a tax for journalism or some kind of license fee until I'm sure that there are more journalists actually getting the stuff right. Now, I know that's hard because a lot of this stuff is a speciality and you have to genuinely be an expert in a lot of areas before what you're publishing is right. But um, do you think there's any sense among journalists that they actually do need to up their game um, and get their expertise right? And that story being one where they got it wrong so much of the time. And there was me yeah. saying this was a self-congratulatory <laughs> weekend. <laughs> um, Ellen. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the diversity thing is an ongoing thing. Um, unpaid internships are still the main gateway into the major kind of print uh, print journalism. And if they're not unpaid, they're paid at a rate that is still just not feasible for anybody who needs to live in Dublin. And we all know, unfortunately, um, a, a viable career outside of Dublin is, is getting increasingly more difficult. Um, I think that on the diversity thing, another thing that I keep trying to say is that as we get to this point where, like, feminism is almost synonymous with populism. It's very important for female journalists in particular to be very conscious of the fact that we are, uh, the things that matter to little millennial uh, liberal women like me in Dublin, you know, I'm not the every woman. Uh, and we need to realize that as we move forward to this point where there is a lot of political capital in feminism, you know, post repeal in particular, we need to be very conscious of the women that are still not being represented in our newsrooms. I mean, it is completely white and it is another thing that I think doesn't get talked about enough is even if you come from a more diverse background, I mean, I'm certainly not from a middle class background, but being a journalist makes you middle class. Like you become middle class immediately and that's something that I saw. I don't like buying into this myth of a, a kind of bubble or group thing think in Leinster House, but there certainly is very quickly the fact that you are working with people who are all from a particular mindset, you're socializing with those people. So you see with certain political issues, um, the consensus can become very compelling and overwhelming to you and you're very, very far removed from, uh, from your actual readers and the people that you're supposed to be representing. So while we're all very focused on getting more women into senior positions in the media, I think we also need to be conscious that just having you know, loads of women like us, basically, uh, is not serving everyone. And we certainly need to be more conscious of the women who are being left behind and are not seeing themselves reflected in journalism like I, mine. I think perhaps, knowing Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> what she was uh, specifically asking you about is, you obviously, you, you've done huge work uh, on repeal, around Repeal the Eighth and all, all, all around those uh, gender issues. Um, are you suggesting that maybe cons more conservative views on gender issues is well, not being represented, and, and that Ellen should consider well, those? A psychoanalyst would say. A psychoanalyst would say, when you're talking about one thing, what are you not talking about? And if there's a particular focus, you know, on a particular group of issues, what's not being talked about? And I would just, I would just urge people maybe to challenge themselves to put down their usual interests and look around and say what else is going on here that I'm not looking at because it doesn't interest me. Well I think part of that goes there to training and um, yeah. one of the worst I, I specialized a lot in my career but actually one of the healthiest things that you can do as a journalist is to move particularly in the early part of your career move early and move often mm -hmm. and you are failing your readers and yourself if you do not challenge yourself to look at the other sides and to look at in anything. So when I look back, I started out as a religious affairs correspondent, one of the best training I ever got. Um, but moving on to health, moving on to politics, um, Northern Ireland, obviously then kind of settled into legal affairs before moving. Um, the, the amount of people who kind of balked when I got appointed as group business editor who correctly were saying, what does she know, know about economics? The answer to which was very, very little, but I knew how to work a brief. 
I knew how to start out somewhere and answer questions and ask what feels like silly questions. And I think there is a danger, and particularly sometimes I think for women, and if this might sound a bit controversial, is that sometimes when you're a female journalist and a senior female journalist, you might feel as if you're carrying the weight of the whole gender equality debate and you shouldn't um, do that. And you have to challenge yourself constantly, particularly around socially conservative issues, actually, and speaking to what you were saying earlier, what are we not hearing? Brexit and Trump was happening in open sight. We just weren't paying attention to it. And to particularly, you know, to listen to um, other voices. So I would always encourage young journalists, move early and move often and get into a zone that you're not kind of comfortable with or that doesn't accord. Actually, go out of your way to challenge yourself something that doesn't accord with your worldviews. Because otherwise, when the tide goes out, you can kind of find yourself a little bit naked if you, if you kind of miss that. So I, I think that as well, sometimes it's really important for female journalists not to be honed particularly by gender issues, even though it's vitally important. Just one thing, it is, we do not have enough women in media, senior women coming through um, the ranks. I would argue though that the biggest challenge we face in our newsrooms is a lack of class diversity. And um, having come through uh, DCU, I did my master's there, these are very, very important routes, but we don't have the paper boy or the paper girls. We don't have the people from um, <coughs> lower socioeconomic working classes who used to come in and work their way up. And I think that that's why we're exposed to some of the bigger issues of the times that we weren't in tune. And if you look particularly around Brexit in the last election, particularly the way we do elections here in Ireland, we're always on the personalities you know, um, the, the leaders and what they're saying. And actually, if you look at some of the most read articles on websites like the Irish Times and the Independent.ie, there were issues that the public cared about, like healthcare, like things, and sometimes we missed all of that. So you constantly have to challenge yourself. And I agree that diversity is much more about just class or gender. It's about are you challenging your own views enough? Yeah, and Susan, just that point uh, that Sarah made as well about bad journalism. <laughs> Do I have to answer this one? Okay, so I think first of all it's important to say, because I did obviously highlight cervical check earlier, I think there's plenty of really good journalism. Look at Mark Tighe's work recently on the FAI um, in the Sunday Times. So there's, you know, there's, it goes without saying that there's plenty of good journalism out there. I think that was a particularly depressing piece, and I've, I've you know, looked at it and examined it and thought about it quite a bit because I have to cover it so extensively. Um, and I think that part of the problem with it was that it was solely seen through the prism of politics. So, and th no disrespect to political correspondents and political editors, etc., but they took hold of the story because it became such a big and significant story for the government. And they only spoke to politicians, and very few of them actually spoke to pathologists, gynaecologists, um, health, like people in health who actually understood screening. Um, and that was why I think it went wrong. And then because the story just took off or blew the roof, it became, no matter what, you know, uh, like Mark McSharry saying the most ridiculous stuff, you know, all over the airwaves. The more outrageous his comments were, the more ignorant they were, the more coverage he got. Um, and it just was like a self-fulfilling kind of, you know, uh, prophecy. So I, I don't know how you really... I, and I, So you asked actually, Sarah, ha, have there been lessons learnt um, I think they probably have actually. Um, so just talking to friends of mine who work on other media outlets, I know that there's been discussions internally about, for example, um, that you know they, they will be more reticent about putting medical negligence lawyers on the airwaves to tell a single story with nobody on the other side to say, well, actually, that's not quite right. Um, and I think that very few, I, I hope, national media outlets will, will, will maybe make that mistake again. Um, and I think, you know, I think some people have, yeah, I, I think lessons have been learned. Sorry, can I Did just make one small point on, on that as well? I think um, a lot of what happened, what Susan's just uh, articulated really well there, a lot of it has to do with the relentless nature of the, of the news cycle as well. It's 24-7 and, it, you know, before if a story broke, you had maybe a day to make calls and ring people and think it through and, you know, bounce it off other people. Now when something happens, you know, the journalists are, you, you're snapping it up online because that's the demand of the job. You have to get it online and it's it's kind of, you know, it's better to be first than right, which is a, obviously a terrible attitude. And that becomes a sort of, you know, a cycle because the story goes up online and then the next story has to be 
more more sensational. And you know, Susan did refer to. I mean, I I have one leg in the the Leinster House bubble. I I, I work as the um, one things I do. I do parliamentary sketch for the Times Ireland. So I'm in there a couple of days a week. But because I'm only in there a couple of days a week, you know, I I, I do I can see sort of outside it. And there is a you know there is a bubble, and the the political correspondents do spend way too much time talking to politicians and not enough time talking to constituents. Um, so, I mean, I'd be the first to say that, and I see it, and I can see how frenzies happen. And that was an exact example of a story that, it was an issue, but became a political story, which was completely wrong, because the, the actual meat of the scandal was sidelined while the political circus went to town, came to town. And that's, I think, something that journalists need to be really careful of as well. I think, you know, it is. But there is this pressure. You've got far few, you, far smaller numbers of journalists, and yet they're thrown into the 24/7 cycle. 24/7 uh, cycle. So they just don't have time to think. And can I just through. say, actually, I agree with you. You know that it is. It's very difficult. I, I have the luxury of working for a Sunday newspaper with a very mediocre website, which none of us really contribute to. So I didn't have to worry about producing stuff on a daily basis. So so I was definitely in a, a more privileged position than most. But I think that, you know, this kind of obsession that we have of getting stuff out first, as opposed to what Lee said there, as opposed to actually just, you know, spending, so, so what if the Indo or the Times put something up one or two hours later than a rival media outlet, if actually they're giving you the explanation, the facts, and the context that you need. I know as a reader what I prefer, I prefer to wait the two hours and I'll go back to that journalist again and again. Mm. And just on all of that, like we're in this moment as well, there's two trends starting to play out. One is called slow news, where you have a new company called Turt Ice over in London set up by the former head of news and BBC, where they have said, we're gonna do five articles a day, that's it. Same with the Economist Espresso, where they're saying less is more, we're going to do it right, we're going to do context, we're going to deliver value, and we're not going to do the dozens and dozens of cut and paste journalism, where if any of us go onto websites and apps of a day, it feels very duplicative, you know, it feels very samey. So what if we were all collaboratively to start to say, take a breath, let's go a little bit slower at this, less is more. And two, the trend start, we're starting to see internationally as well is actually more around collaborative news. Because in breaking news scenarios, you really do not have an IP. There is nothing going to be a major differentiator. So again, why don't we step back and actually collaborate on stories? And this is starting to play out with a group called First Draft. They have managed to take 200 major newsrooms around the world when it comes to elections in France, in Spain, Brazil, United States, the midterms, they had hundreds of journalists in one place collaborating together around the facts and actually saying, well, have you got an answer to that piece of it? They'd share the information and then they'd go off and produce stories together. And those journalists could be confident, we're going to go to our own audiences now with this, but we know we've got the weight of 200 journalists behind us to make sure that what we're delivering is accurate and of value. And it's probably something here we haven't become sensitised to yet in Europe, but it is a movement that I would celebrate in an industry that is way too competitive and there is value in actually Which journalists collaborating. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Can I make one comment? Um, you've, the word content providers came up and it came up in the context of journalists, as I understand it, feeling that somehow they've been, that their, their value has been pushed down, both amongst themselves and in terms of how they're viewed. Authors have been facing exactly the same thing. People in the arts have been facing exactly the same thing. I remember when the BBC first started calling actors talent <laughs> and first started calling scriptwriters content providers. And I recognise that as a sort of starting point that came a canary down the mind. And it was wonderful to hear about the day of professional journalists. Language matters and we should be grabbing hold of that too. Thanks for listening. <coughs> Do I see a hand tentatively go up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kira from Gibson News, and I find with a lot of millennials coming in, their unique selling point to us is that they're uh, digital first, that they're digital natives. And I have a huge issues with your staff and my basic journalism. Um, so it's almost like, and I think the problem with uh, management telling them that they're fantastic and we're the future, this is what we need, but yet they don't spend they think that they, they own the newsroom and they don't have the basic skills. Do you find that's somewhere in your newsrooms? Yeah, I think that whole digital first thing became just such a mantra 
you know, um, sorry, you know, digital first became such a mantra, and I think that what we lost in the art was it, that it is journalism first. What was really, really interesting about Storyful was that, for, to, to my mind, what it combined was old school journalism. The, you know, building up that trust, but actually with new digital formats. I think as older people in the industry, we were getting freaked out, you know, every time the training came around, oh my God, can you work this device or that device? And, and that kind of created a lot of angst and anxiety, I think, in a lot of newsrooms. And of course, the means of distribution is changing and we have to, um, you know, train people up in terms of, of doing that. And I remember the first time you're getting training on, you know, how do you, you know, do mobile journalism or how do you, you know, do that? And it's trying to make it all seamless. But behind that, and I think actually that's, and I see it, with a lot of millennials, what they actually forget is that there is a craft behind what you do. Yes, you're digital first, you're digital native in terms of how you can distribute the technology, but there is a craft to what we do, and it takes 10 or 15 years to get it right. And you know, so, and, and obviously, and I think sometimes people are looking at these technology companies and everything, and these kind of, you know, young, um, you know, multi-millionaires. I've been following this young, um, this, uh, a, a, a young Irish guy called Kevin Glynn, who set up a company in London um, that basically delivers human edible food for dogs, like sort of upmarket dog food and him and his friend were in Goldman Sachs and they quit it and they started up and I just saw yesterday that they got another 15 million sterling round, you know, and you're just gonna be, God, they're not even 30 and they're in the, the Forbes top 30 under 30, but sometimes I think millennials and, and the generations here look into that and saying I can do that and that it's brilliant, but actually you forget that, you know, the overnight success, to borrow an old phrase, usually comes after 20 years of learning the craft and I think that that is where you need the intergenerational uh, skills in a newsroom because when you go out first with something wrong, you know, nobody re usually remembers who goes out first with something right, but when you go out first with something wrong, and that's what I think is that lost art. I always go back to, you know, Fiona McHugh in the newsroom, it was just like, it's Wednesday, why are you here? When I was in the Sunday Times, you know, getting out and um, doing what, you know, um, what people kind of hated, but, you know, your first couple of uh, death knocks that you do. You know, going out and actually speaking to people in distressing situations, the first kind of, you know, major thing that you go to and you have to go and you have to go to cultivate contacts, be it with guards, be it whatever, and that bit you cannot do from your phone. You cannot replace the art of building trust and building contacts. So, yeah, don't let them overwhelm you. There's a craft to be learned. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi, Julie. Um, There's a mic oh, coming to you oh, there. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to start again. Hi, I'm Julia Ebner. I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a London-based think tank. And we do a lot of work on, on the spread of disinformation, misinformation, and also some of have done some investigative research into the back ends of, kind of some of these alternative far-right um, news outlets and what the networks look like. And I think in the US, um, a massive network of some of those outlets was uncovered and we're now doing a similar investigation into some of these European from Germany to, to English language channels that are spreading, often spreading distorted or, or even disinformation um, or distorted news or hyperpartisan news. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, do you think, because a lot of these news outlets are so tightly connected that they have a massive voice on, especially social media, but, um, do you think there's a need between um, the, the trustworthy sources to instead of um, compete to something to also cooperate, especially in the online space, to, um, to kind of outvoice those alternative news sources? Because it seems that they're, um, yeah, that from the portion that we saw on, on social media, especially, that sometimes these networks just have a, a hugely disproportionate voice just because of the way that they recycle each other's um, news and the, the way that they use search engine optimization, for example. Yeah, I'm yeah, happy to take that. So I think, yeah, in this misinformation disorder, there is a responsibility on everyone from the platforms to the newsrooms to librarians. That this is going to be cross-platform, cross-industry to actually really tackle it. And I go back to my earlier point. This is a wicked problem. It's contradictory. It's constantly changing. And there's no one solution. So we need everything from the platforms applying machine learning um, to it so that they're detecting these fake hoaxes, the bad actors who are spewing misinformation across the networks, calling them out, banning them, uh, in, ensuring that they're amplifying quality news and, and ultimately downranking uh, the bad actors. 
Equally then, with, when we go up to newsrooms, there is a responsibility to what I just mentioned in terms of that collaborative framework that you mentioned, but very specifically around elections where we know there is always an increased amount of activity by bad actors. And that means more and more fact-checking units. Like I think in this country we only have one formal fact-checking unit in operation in one of the organisations. There probably should be more given that we have a lot of referenda in this country and elections. So there's definitely a collaborative nature required there. Because it's in effect, the Pointer International Fact Checking Network that you'll be aware of, they have managed to bring the smallest to the largest newsrooms world over and support them in putting in place fact checking units. And those fact checkers are now going on platforms like Facebook and saying that article is bogus, they're putting flags on it. Facebook is then saying, okay, the fact checkers have disputed that, we better downright that in our algorithm. So there's definitely a lot of responsibility there. But also we have to think, and I, I used to work in Facebook, I was based in New York for two years, I used to have librarians come to me all the time, and they used to say to me, there are more libraries than Starbucks in America, please use us to help within this moment of questions around trust and manipulation. What is our role when it comes to news literacy? And I think that's our big long-term play, and we're not doing enough of it here in this country. You can have all the technology solutions, journalists can do their best to collaborate, and we can have fact-checking, but we also need to make sure we are teaching it in our schools, because I'm sorry to say, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, it's a part of our lives, it's been there since the 1400s, it is just human nature that we sometimes spread and spew misinformation. So how do we actually give our kids critical thinking skills and that's where the schools come into play and all of the research in the US suggests that it's at 12 years of age that we actually need to inoculate our kids against fake news and actually teach them how to seek out trustworthy content and actually call BS on that piece of content and say I'm going to be the first to tell my friends and family that is wrong, do not share it. So it's going to take a holistic approach and wide collaboration from schools to libraries, platforms and back to newsrooms. And yeah, definitely schools, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, okay, We're, I'm only going to take another one, so. Hello, my name is Laura. I'm a master's in broadcast journalism student over in the UK. Um, I'm just becoming increasingly disillusioned with the lack of um, opportunity that there is for young journalists here in Ireland. Um, where you see journalism going, what advice would you give now to a young journalist starting out that's just trying to get a foot in a newsroom anywhere. What would you be your one token of advice to a young journalist? I could say it's a too late to change your degree. <laughs> <laughs> it's a master of silver and joy to That was a joke. Uh, uh, at least. Well, um, I think the the best journalists, sort of young journalists I've ever worked with, are the ones, the brazen ones, you know, the ones that will literally stop in the street and walk into a newsroom and go, you should hire me, you know. What, give me a start, like literally going back to the trade thing. Um, and I actually think getting into journalism, getting in isn't actually that difficult because the newsrooms are always looking for people. They're always, they are genuinely looking for you know, bodies on a, on a casual basis, not on the staff jobs are gone. But um, I mean, if I had one piece of advice is, you know, to a journalist is, you know, don't promise anything you can't deliver and deliver it accurately on time. Like that really is, that's, a, that's really it. I mean, the bar is... That, you know, that's, that's all an editor wants is, you know, don't get a sued, don't leave a hole in the page, you know, and, and, and be accurate. And um, a lot of, certainly when I worked in Sunday Tribune, um, we took in, you know, a lot of students from the, from the various journalism courses and schools. And the good ones never left. They literally, from day one, made themselves useful. And I think... It's the, it's the desire to, you know, to actually scrabble around and find stories. I mean, it's all about self-starting. Can, can, can I just add something yeah. that? For a couple of years, I was a judge on the European <coughs> Young Journalist of the Year Awards, and then they found out I voted against one of the treaties, and, and that ended. Um, but, um, but Was it Lisbon? Was it Lisbon? Or, or the Lisbon Treaty, as my mother called it. But, um, but what was interesting about that, my concern after, and it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to look at young journalists all over Europe, but what worried me over time was that the entries that we were seeing were opinion, they weren't journalism. And, you know, they were anonymised, you didn't see it. So what we were seeing was very, very articulate people with amazing opinions, but we were saying, okay, well, perhaps maybe what is lacking is that they haven't gone and spoken to the government department 
you, let's say you're writing about something, or they haven't gone and spoken to a key player. And I think that one of the things that perhaps younger people have to realise in this era where everybody is a publisher is that, you know, there is a role for opinion in journalism, but pursuing the facts and pursuing the story, that's what an editor is interested in. So pursue the stories, your, your, your role as an opinion writer and everything else will come later and you can get to articulate that on any amount of forums that you want. But actually chasing a story and chasing a story that is reliable. And also interrogate, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, as a commissioning editor, people will be, I would be getting emails and I'm just going, they don't know who I am, they don't know who the team are, they're just sort of kind of saying, find out who the editors are, find out who the news editors are, find out who the commissioning editors are, and you work it, and you just kind of keep turning up at their door. It used to be um, that if you got across, I first started working for the Daily Mail as a, uh, or what it was, the Mail on Sunday, but it was Ireland on Sunday at the time, it was just before it had changed over, and I wrote a piece for them, um, and basically it was, I used to think it was actually the late Paul Drury, and I harassed him so much, that he eventually, out of exhaustion, said, okay, you can have a Saturday job. You know, um, and do that, but do it intelligently. But that would be my one advice maybe to younger journalists, is that the time will come for you to write opinion pieces, and, and that's an art and a trade, but again, all of that is still based on fact. Give them good stories, and no editor will turn away a good yarn. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, my one piece of advice would be, you know, start at the end and work backwards. So the end might look very different to where you're going to have your first step in the door. And so it means thinking a little bit differently about the companies that need journalists. And so Storyful was referenced earlier. We hired people who were just really good at asking critical thinking uh, at questions and then apply that to who is the source, when did this happen, and put the story together. And the fact is tech companies hire journalists because of those critical thinking skills. You look at LinkedIn is in this country, Twitter, Yahoo, all of those companies hire journalists to actually do curation on the back end because what a lot of technology companies have realized we can't only have algorithms. We need a human layer on top of the technology deciding what gets through, actually putting context as well to pieces. So I would say to you, be brave to think and redefine sometimes what journalism is, where journalists work, and if you look at tech companies, think about discovery, distribution, engagement, and what are the companies that are trying to put all of that together from a storyful to a LinkedIn, there are definitely roles there for editorial. I just before we go, I want to ask all the panel, uh, how optimistic or pessimistic would you be about the future of journalism? Say on a, from a scale of one to ten, one being we're at death's door, <laughs> good night and good luck, and ten being this is a challenging time, but we will come through it, it'll transform and it will go on. Uh, I'm probably somewhere around a six, seven, only because I'm starting to see new revenue models. We got addicted to advertising. <coughs> that model is broken. We know that Google and Facebook take up something like 90% of new online revenue. So that is gone for, for new digital entities. It's 10% that everybody's fighting it out over. So the new model is now around membership and building communities and subscriptions. Once we don't leave people behind, I am confident of that. And it's this millennial generation because they're the ones seeking productive use of their time, services, bundled quality, that we're seeing that green shoot, that they're prepared to pay for and use that generation. That gives me tremendous hope. Okay, six and a half. Uh, <laughs> Ellen? Um, I'm going to go with a conservative five uh, because I think it literally could go either way. Um, if we do pursue those new models and get the value of journalism through to people, then absolutely it could be like a little revolution, a little renaissance, particularly for Irish journalism. But if con things continue exactly the way they are now, I'm 28 and I think I'd be lucky to still have a job in journalism at the age of 35 if things still continue the way they are now. Um, it's, you know, we're, I think Katie kind of hinted on it earlier. I don't think the public really understand the, how dire the situation is in print newspapers at the moment. But on a happier note, if we do um, kind of shock people into realising it, then this actually could be um, it could be a little revolution for Irish journalism as well. I think. Okay, a conservative five, please. <laughs> well, I think one for print. I mean, I think it is. It's at death's door. That's it. I mean, you won't see any uh, new print newspapers in. I'd say within five years, I'd be like, if, if that. I mean, I think it's that bad. It is that bad. Um, for future journalism generally, uh, nine. I mean, I, I think there's, as long as there's news, somebody has to tell it. And as I said, you know, I started out on, a, on an underworld typewriter, and I mean, I'll probably end up, if I stay in this gig, you know, 
probably chip in you. yeah chip in me actually just talking into my wrist. <laughs> but I think yeah, so I mean I think journalism will endure. It's yeah. just in a form we don't recognise now. So I'd be po I'd be positive. Yeah. Okay. I'll now turn to the future. So I think um, what we're going to see in Ireland is what we've maybe seen in the US and other jurisdictions that have already been through the revulsions. It's going to be difficult and painful over the next um, couple of, of years. But on the broader, so it'd be kind of on a four in terms of just kind of those pains that we're going to have to go through. But on the broader issue, I'll go back to what I said at the absolute outset, there is no job like this. It is an extraordinary privilege and as long as there are stories, people are going to come into the world who want to sell and tell them. Um, and that's us. And that's what we do. So I'm optimistic about it, but the manner and the way we do things will have changed utterly. But look at the revival of issues such as long-form journalism. We heard last night uh, on the literary panel about the essays. And I don't think newspapers will disappear entirely because we do our journalism now, whether it's audio, video, whether you want to see it, pictures, all of those things. So, But I do think that we are going to see some fairly, fairly heavy hitting casualties. And my only concern about that, to my otherwise optimism, is that it's going to pose huge fundamental questions for our democracy and particularly around um, elections, including in Ireland, where we think we're immune for a far right, but actually is building up quite slow, you know, uh, gradually here too. Okay. Uh, could I have a number please, Doug? Okay, so four on the immediate, um, nine on the long term. Okay. And Susan. So I'm, I'm not very uh, optimistic or hopeful about the future of print media, but I'm probably slightly more hopeful than Lise uh, was. I think you gave it a, a one, and that's only just because, speaking about myself, I find I, was, I subscribe online to the Financial Times, the Irish Times, the Times Ireland, the New York Times, the Economist, the New Yorker, the Atlantic. I can't read them all. I don't actually get through them all, and I find I flit, and then an email pops up, and I've actually started buying newspapers again. So even though I subscribe to, 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 to most of them, I'm now buying the hard copies because I actually enjoy becoming completely engrossed in that experience, as opposed to having my iPad where then I check, oh, I'll check Twitter, check my email. So I wonder, will, will there be a bit like, is it uh, like old records? Will there be a bit of a, of a renaissance of, uh, of, of newspapers? Anyway, so I'm not, I'm not quite as, uh, not quite as, as negative. Um, and I, I do think there's, there's a future for journalism because I think people want information and facts, and people want, you know, those in power to be held to account. I just think it's going to look very, very different, and I think there probably won't be as many of us in the game. A six. Uh, seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to thank uh, what I think you'd all agree is an excellent panel. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, and I wish to make way now because the political panel is coming up, the political symposium, where Mary Dundon is going to be finding out how to solve the housing crisis. So we must make space for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>